Today we'll create an axisymmetric multi-step nonlinear analysis of the first two stages of the compressor. We'll begin with the second stage, which is a blisk, and we'll create a new fem. And because we're going to be incorporating contact, we'll select high res polygon bodies. And because it's axisymmetric, we'll define the XY plane as the axisymmetric plane and create a cyclic cesis. All right, beginning in the idealized part, we need to create a representation in the axisymmetric plane of our blisk. So to do that we'll first get an associative copy of it and we'll put that on layer 11. We'll go ahead and create our axisymmetric representation of it in layer 12. Now to do that we have some automation in SimCenter 3D to be able to create a revolve outline and this will account for all of not only the axisymmetric features but also those plain stress features such as the blades and the holes. And here we want that to be on the positive Y side of the axisymmetric plane. So I'll reverse that and I'll turn off the solid and you can see here our axisymmetric outline. Now these are just curves at this point. We need surfaces to mesh on, so I'll create a bounded plane for that. And I'm going to be using uh, connected curves that'll um, simplify the number of picks that I need to make, as well as stop at intersection, because there's some decisions in terms of what direction we want to take uh, when we come up against some of those plane stress features. So I'll encompass the entire outline and then we'll divide the face by those feature curves of the revolve outline. So now we have individual faces for our plane stress regions and our axisymmetric regions. So now we'll bring the sheet bodies into our FEM. and we'll create some meshes. We'll begin uh, with the plane stress uh, regions. So we'll create a plane stress mesh. We'll make sure our selection bar is on polygon face, so we're just getting the one face. And we'll select uh, an element size meshing method and uh, some meshing parameters. And we'll automatically create a new collector. All right, so we'll edit the collector to define the material property. Here we'll specify titanium. I'm not going to specify a thickness in the physical property table. Instead, we're going to use mesh associated data to use some automation in SimCenter 3D to specify that it's a hole and we have 45 of them around the circumference. And that will automatically calculate the plane stress thickness for the elements. And here we can plot a contour representation of those thicknesses. All right, so let's do the next plane stress region, which will be the blade. That's a little bit larger area. We'll make a slightly coarser mesh there. And we'll put it into the same plane stress collector to inherit the same material. But this one has a slightly more complex thickness profile. I have a field predefined that we'll use for that. Go ahead and bring that in. And you can see here that that thickness field is in a 3D orientation. It's actually the mid-surface thickness of the solid blade which we're going to map onto the plane stress representation of it. So I'll just specify uh, 
that we're going to use that field for the thickness definition of that plane stress region. And we can also specify that there's 47 blades that will um, scale the thickness by that factor. All right, there you can see our thickness contours for the blades. Next, we'll create some axisymmetric meshes on the remainder of the disk. And we'll create a new axisymmetric collector. And specify the same material, titanium. All right, now we can bring this component finite element model into an assembly finite element model that I've been working on with uh, the first stage and the forward shaft, the bolt, and a piece of the third stage as well to complete the bolted assembly. So in the assembly FEM, we'll go ahead and map that second stage into it. Here I'll select list only associated finite element models and we'll put it on the original layer. As you can see it leverages the assembly position to correctly position the model in the axisymmetric assembly FEM. Alright, but there are uh, most likely some labeling conflicts between nodes and elements coordinate systems. So we'll go ahead and resolve those using the automatic uh, resolution algorithm. And now we just need to connect it in to the rest of the assembly. And we'll do that with contact, not surface to surface contact, because that's a 3D, it's looking for a 3D surface, uh, but edge edge contact. That's our axisymmetric nonlinear contact specification. So here we'll manually specify the contact pairs, and I've got a contact region on the aft face of the forward shaft that we'll use to go up against a new region that we'll define on the second stage. And here you can see the edges are overlapping uh, and you can see which body that edge corresponds to with the quick pick. So we'll make sure that we're getting the edge associated with the second stage disk body. Then we can put in a coefficient of friction, which I have a parameter specified for. All of the contact has the same uh, coefficient of friction. And then we can also specify a min search distance in case there's any initial penetrations. And it will create the edge edge contact. Now, I don't necessarily want that to be in just one subcase, because I've got a couple of subcases here. But I could specify it in just one. I want it to be uh, in all subcases. So I'll go ahead and remove that from the active subcase and then also deactivate the preload subcase so that our next edge edge contact will go into the global container and be applied to all subcases. So here we'll create our next edge edge contact and we'll reuse the region on the third stage forward face to pair up with a new region that we'll define on the second stage disk. Again using the quick pick to ensure that we're getting the edge associated with the correct body. All right, that looks good. So we'll put in our coefficient of, coefficient of static friction and min search distance. And we've completed our contact specification. All right, next uh, we'll define a temperature load, which I have a field defined already. Uh, that field is not in the correct orientation 
we'll go ahead and specify the coordinate system for our axisymmetric uh, cross-section here to align the temperature field in the correct location. So now you can see the representation of those thermal results as a field. And uh, let's go ahead and hide that and apply it as a temperature load in our structural analysis. So here I want to apply it to all of the bodies that we've meshed. And we'll select that temperature field that we just imported. And then to make sure that we've got it right, we can plot the temperature contours on the mesh to see how it interpolated. Let's look at a contour plot with the contour bands and we'll turn off the mesh and just have the feature lines. And you can see that those temperatures look like they've mapped well onto the mesh. All right, next we'll create some bolt preload. So here, if we take a closer look at the bolt, you can see we've got a division in the mesh, but we do have coincident nodes. And what the force on 2D solid element cut plane will do is it will split the mesh on that uh, division, and we can specify how much preload we'd like to put into the bolt in that location. All right, now I also have a rotational load uh, that we've already specified. And we'll go ahead and solve. Here, I'll pause the movie. You can see, though, since this is an axisymmetric model, it solves very quickly, uh, less than 30 seconds. And we've got some results. So here you can see we've got two subcases of results. The first is just the bolt preload and resolving the contact that we've specified there. So here you can see uh, it's, it's pulling either side of that cut plane together. You can animate that to a very slight amount that it overlaps in order to uh, generate the specified preload. And here you can see the stress in it. There's also a bolt preload uh, result case where you'd be able to see that applied 10,000 uh, 5,000 pounds All right next we'll look at our spin up subcase and we can see the displacements due to the rotational load We can exaggerate those uh, So that we can better visualize uh, how the model is deflecting there But we'll go for the uh, the nonlinear absolute one-to-one -one results and we can look at uh, stresses in the entire model, but we're really interested in the stresses on the fillet on the disc. So let's go ahead and turn off all of the other components in our finite element model and focus in on the second stage disc. And let's go ahead and find um, where the, the max stress is there. Well, it's really that, that stress that we're interested in reducing. So that we can easily come back to this post-processing view, we'll create a snapshot uh, that will allow us to uh, quickly come back to the view post-processing, just the second stage and the stress. And now we'll make a CAD change. So we'll go ahead and make this radius a bit larger. Here it's 0.15. We'll make it half an inch and see how that affects the stress in that area. So because we have a CAD associative finite element model, making that change will update our revolve section. So that's fully associative. Our uh, mesh here as well is fully associative. You can see the geometry is updated here. All we need to do is update the finite element model and the mesh will conform 
to the updated geometry. Next we'll go to the assembly FEM and resolve any potential node and element conflicts that may have arisen from that uh, mesh update. And now we can go to the sim and solve, but because we want to keep our original results so we can view them side by side with our updated uh, results, I'll go ahead and clone the solution and solve it. Then we'll go ahead and pause the movie and you can see in another a uh, little under 30 seconds, we've got updated results. So let's go ahead and view those side by side. Here, uh, let's go into post-processing first, and then we can activate the snapshot. So here now we don't have to turn off all of those uh, other components we can just apply the snapshot and it remembers how we were uh, viewing those results. Now we'd like to view that side by side with our updated results. So let's go ahead and put those results in the other view. Go ahead and synchronize the views so we're looking at the same view of the results. And then go ahead and turn off all the other components in the other view. So we're just looking at the stage two results. So even though the max is of course down on the ID of the hub, let's uh, see what the stresses look like on the fillet here. So we'll make a, an annotation on our model here. And we want to make sure we're looking at average stress on the right as well as on the left. So we'll go ahead and make sure we've got average left and right. And then create our annotation. So here we'll, we'll select the node uh, that's got the max stress. And uh, we also could do this um, with the identifier results using the um, max option and just box select the nodes in that region. But here I wanted to create uh, an annotation uh, at that max. So you can see we've got 745 PSI on the right and on the left uh, we'll select the max location which is uh, 760. So you can see a uh, larger radius as we'd expect reduces the max stress in that region. And that concludes the demonstration. Thank you.